Hello and welcome to Around the Lens episode 44. I am your host, David J. Murphy. And I am your co-host, Zach D. Roberts. Uh, if this is your first time checking out the show, Around the Lens is a live weekly visual journalism roundtable show airing every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern. We are broadcasting live this October 3rd, 2016. And we're actually broadcasting, we're simulcasting actually on both Facebook and YouTube just to kind of see how this works. I'd like to see which audience is bigger. Yeah. Uh, if we get more than two people watching at the same time, it'll be bigger than YouTube. <laughs> Anyways, we feature experts in the world of photo journalism and documentary filmmaking talking about new topics, gear, and news related to our career field. And if you want to know more about me or Dave and learn how to, uh, about how to connect to us, uh, or, uh, to us, the show, uh, go to, uh, or, or via social media, and I'm completely messing up my line, <laughs> just go to our website, aroundthelens.com. It's been a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're a little rusty. At least I didn't mess up this time. So <laughs> now we both got to mess up under our belts. All right. So we got a great show tonight, great panelists. Uh, we got uh, our newcomer, uh, Mark Rice, and our returning panelist, Jamie Rose. Uh, panelists, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves to our audience? I'll go ahead and introduce myself first. I'm Mark Rice, and <clears throat> I'm a photojournalist working uh, at the Gazette newspaper in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I've been a photojournalist for more than 30 years, uh, all, awesome. of that, all of that time in daily newspaper work, and I am passionate about, uh, about the daily newspaper world, which is not dead, contrary to what you might hear. What? <laughs> I do know that uh, we do still have readers. We have, uh, uh, I, I will admit, an, an aging population of readers. Uh, we're very active online, um, and I'm, uh, you know, still doing what I was doing 30 years ago, which is uh, telling, telling the stories of our community and the things that our community is interested in uh, through our photos. So I love it, and I'm actually the director of photography at the newspaper. Uh, oh, great. Which isn't saying a whole lot. There's only four of us uh, still photographers on the staff right now, but uh, but I get to sort of sort of run things, but also I still get to shoot. So it's a good good sized staff. Okay, great. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your uh, experience uh, at the Olympics? I know you were uh, able to shoot down there, and we did actually want to have you on the. Uh, the show to talk about that, but unfortunately that wasn't possible. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Absolutely. I uh, uh, just, I guess, two months ago was, was in Rio covering the Olympic Games on assignment again for my newspaper. Uh, this was my ninth uh, Olympic Games on assignment for the Gazette. Uh, and you might, you know, say, gee, the Gazette, it's sort of a mid-sized daily newspaper. Uh, we are easily the smallest or among the smallest newspapers credentialed uh, for the Olympics. And it's primarily because the U.S. Olympic Committee is, is headquartered here in Colorado Springs. And uh, the U.S. Olympic Training Center is also uh, here in town. So we have a lot of sort of local stories to tell. And that's why my newspaper makes a, a huge commitment, uh, financially especially, to send reporters and photographers uh, to cover the Olympic Games. So Rio is, like I said, it was my ninth and fantastic experience as always. Uh, I, you know, I, I encourage if anyone wants to look at the work I did, I, I do just posted some, uh, a gallery of images on my website, which is uh, uh, underneath my network next to my name here. Feel free to go, go check those out. I'm, I'm quite proud of, of the work I did in Rio. But it's, you know, an incredible honor to, to be there documenting the stories of these athletes, uh, like I said, many of them local, many of them have local connections, but, but I, the Gazette allows me to, to cover both the local athletes, but also some of the bigger stories, of course, the Michael Phelps, uh, you know, the women's gymnastics, the things that, uh, that our readers really wanna uh, see images from and read stories about. So, uh, fantastic experience, like I said, and, uh, and I'm, I'm a fortunate guy. I spend a lot of time pinching myself when I'm at the games, because you know, sometimes I just can't believe I'm in the front row at the Olympic Games. It's it's phenomenal. Nice, nice. Um, can you talk to us? Uh, like, what was your favorite sport to capture, and um, you know, what was kind of like some of your favorite photos that you you got out of the event? Oh, it's a it's a really good question. It it's always hard for me to to pick a 
a favorite moment. I think in general, my favorite uh, moments of the Olympic Games are almost always uh, the unscripted moments. Uh, I mean, you, you kind of know, you know, a couple days into the Olympics, you know, Michael Phelps is going to swim for another gold medal. Uh, so those aren't big surprises. But, you know, every now and then there's a, an upset. Uh, we have a lot of local wrestlers who were there, um, two of them who have a local connection were really supposed to medal. They were they pretty much locks for gold medals and neither of them made it to the gold medal uh, match. You know, on the other side of the coin though, two, uh, two wrestlers, uh, both of them who have a little bit of connection to Colorado Springs, one of them went to high school here, uh, came out of nowhere and were huge surprise upset wins uh, in wrestling, uh, female, uh, and, and a male. And it's those kinds of moments that sort of make it so exciting to be there because at the Olympics, those athletes' emotions are just, you know, so close to the surface. Uh, you know, I think we all see that, you know, looking at the images, that their reactions, win or lose, are just so raw and genuine. And it's, you know, again, a privilege to, to get to photograph them. So probably those wrestling moments were really great. Um, but of course, it was you know it was great to be there for the the women's gymnastics, uh, mainly because I know so many people back home you know were watching to see how the the U.S. women would do, uh, and they didn't disappoint, and they were just you know they made great images. Uh, it, it would be hard for me to pick my favorite uh, my favorite image from the games. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty proud of a of a bunch of them. Great, great. Um, well. Uh Jamie, uh, we haven't had you on for a bit. What's been going on with you since we last chatted? Uh, um, well, let's see. I just got back from teaching our Project Portland workshop last week, which was pretty incredible. And um, right now, my husband is with a group of students, and they are all down in Colombia. He's teaching our nonprofit workshop in Colombia. So, it's been an exciting 24 hours, that's for sure, for that group down there. Um, Jealous yeah. of that. That's to be down there when the when the uh, uh, the vote came down. That would have been fascinating. Yeah, surprising. Although they're in a city that everyone knew was probably not going to uh, not going to vote for it. So I think it's going to be a big waiting game right now. Yeah, <laughs> hoping it's safe. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, glad to have you back as always. You know, we, we had an awesome show last time you were here. And I think we're going to have another awesome show this week. So uh, really great to have you both on. And I look forward to some awesome visual journalism discussion. I actually do want to say a little known fact. Uh, Mark was on my old podcast I did. Uh, actually, my second podcast uh, that I did, which has since been eradicated from the Internet. But was a great conversation. I still have the recording, Mark. Don't worry. Uh, but it was, it was a great conversation. We talked about what was that? The uh, it was twenty fourteen, I believe. So we were talking about. That sounds right. It was right after uh, the Sochi. It was right after the Sochi Games. I yes. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the the one of the most uh, memorable stories I remember from that conversation was about the pins. Did Did you hand out pins again this year? I did, absolutely. I wish I had some here. I don't have any here with me, but I just, I'll just i refresh that story that at, at the Olympics, I always have made up uh, little souvenir pins, uh, like collector's pins, and they just say, you know, the Gazette, Rio 2016, uh, and you just hand them out to, to people you come across. They're great uh, conversation starters, but more importantly, they're like... Uh, Little, they cost me about a couple bucks a piece, and they're kind of like little hundred-dollar bribes. You hand them to uh, security guards and police officers, and uh, you know, photo venue managers uh, who are maybe in a position to help you get to a better position. Um, and and it's it's amazing. Sometimes they're just great, like I said, conversation starters and a, a gift to give to somebody. But it's amazing the number of times that. Uh, that, that little that little little gift of a of a souvenir pin, and the reason why they they sway so much uh, weight is because people collect them at the Olympics. You know, every you know Coca Cola, you know, every big sponsor of the Olympics gives out these pins. So you see people walking around with loads of these pins all over their lanyards and their hats, and 
and then you find some some security guard who's seen this but has been never given a pin and when you give him one it's it's pretty uh it's pretty amazing and you know i've always had the opinion that security guards are are you know not necessarily my enemy and they're not there to to keep me from getting good pictures but it, it you know it, it really helps to get people like that uh on your side so. awesome Great. Hopefully it worked out uh, as well for you this year. And you got some great access. I did. Absolutely. Mark, did you get to photograph Ashton Eaton? Uh, no. That's so funny. Uh, Damn. <laughs> he's, from, he's from my town. So, oh, like, really? it's big news out here. Yeah, he's from so, Bend, Oregon, and okay. I live in the town right next to it. So, yeah. like, and I do subscribe to my local newspaper, and awesome. the Bend oh. Bulletin just was so great on coverage, and it was just so much fun to watch him. Oh, Jamie, I'm so happy to hear that. I, you know, I end up getting to the venue at just as he was finishing his last event. I can't remember what, what else was going on that night, but uh, just kind of caught a glimpse, but uh, I didn't really get much of him. All right, well, let's go ahead and get on with the show. We got a lot of great topics to talk about tonight. Uh, we start, of course, as always, with the news. So what is going on in the news today, which, by the way, you can follow us live. Or you can follow us uh, at our website, AroundTheLens.com. If you'd like to follow the stories we're talking about, it's the, the first story up on there, the Around the Lens 44 preview. So Snapchat recently announced uh, they got some glasses with some video cameras in them that can record videos that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, go directly to Snapchat. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so, you know, we've seen this type of, on face sort of camera technology before. I mean, GoPros have a head mount forever. Google Glass came out and didn't go anywhere. Uh, and now Snapchat's doing their thing with a $130 pair of video recording glasses. Uh, what do we think of this You know, new technology, this, this new innovation? Is it something that's going to affect uh, how we gather imagery and, and you know uh, document events? Jamie, why don't you go ahead and start? Well, they did the one thing that Google didn't do and that low pro just can't do for sheer functionality is that they made them look cool. Mm -hmm. Like they actually, they hit the like perfect demographic of, you know, people who are going to spend $130 on a pair of sunglasses, which is, you know, not my generation. <laughs> Probably it's the young kids and they actually look like, really neat and I mean the the Google glasses looked kind of creepy yeah. <laughs> they looked kind of foggy ish so I think that it's a pretty smart move on their part and my sister has said forever that she wished she had a camera in her eye <laughs> and it's this is it this is this is the next generation of being able to photograph anything you see whether you you know are good at it or not is going to be a question, and I I think it's I think it's really interesting. I don't know if I would buy them. I've never even been on Snapchat to be honest, so I don't. So think what keeps you from buying them is the style, or is the uh, the functionality, or the price? I mean, for what it is, for one hundred and thirty dollars, I mean that's how much you remember those little. Um, what were they called? Zoom video cameras or whatever, those yeah. little handheld ones that went into the USB port. Like those were a hundred bucks. I bought one of those and it was convenient, nice to like throw in your purse or whatever. Um, I'm just, I, I, I'm more of a wait and see person on this type of technology. However, I think, I think they look good. So that's one step in the right direction. Okay. How about you, uh, Mark? Do you think these things are going to be revolutionizing uh, the way we document uh, things? Yikes! I I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say I would have to say I'm not a fan. Um, I'm also like Jamie. I'm not you know I'm not on Snapchat. Um, and you know when I look at them, they're if if I look at them as kind of a toy gimmick, I I, I say yeah, that's wonderful. I think it's fun. You know anything that gets people involved in in making images. Uh, making interesting images, capturing what they see. On the one hand, I've got to say that's that's great, but on the other hand, um, you know, for being a person who, you know, my passion is shooting photos that I I hope are timeless and are going to be around. The whole idea of of Snapchat doesn't sit great with me. 
because these are images that are that are gone uh, yeah. quite quickly. Um, so I, I don't know. It's uh, it's 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 a tough one for me. Um, you know, I don't would like you use it. Would you use it for fun? Maybe not for professional work, but would you ever think you'd see yourself wearing it? You know, no, because you know, if I am going to shoot, you know, I've always got my phone with me. If I'm going to shoot uh, that quick image or that quick video, that's not something I'm going to pick up my, you know, my big DSLR for. Right. Um, I, I just think of how much more I can do with that thing that's always in my pocket. Uh, sure. Just the fact that it's not worn on my face doesn't slow me down. And for me, uh, so many times I'm, I'm shooting pictures with my camera or videos with my cam with my phone, sorry, where I, I'm shooting somewhere that I'm not looking. Uh, the idea of these glasses, obviously it's recording exactly what you're seeing, but I think about the number of times that I'm, you know, I'm looking ahead, you know, if I'm skiing or if I'm doing something and I want to video someone next to me, you know, I'm holding the camera off to the side just for that you know, or down close to the ground or looking for some kind of an angle that's a little more interesting other than just what is being seen from, from eye level. And I've always, sure. when I as a photographer, uh, you know, I always, I know that all of us go looking at the world from eye level. You know, for me, I'm six foot tall, but, you know, you figure just about everyone sees the, the world from that level. So whenever I'm shooting, I a lot of time spend, spend a lot of effort to, to see something differently to show somebody what it looks like from down at ground level or climbing up on something and, and shooting down. So I guess that whole eye level thing, I, this is a, a long explanation for me just kind of justifying, I'm probably not going to go buy some. Short answer, no. <laughs> well, I think if you hey, were Mark, like... Can you do me a favor real quick? Can you turn your headphones so the uh, the microphone is a, just a little bit away from your one down oh. here is a little because it's bumping into your collar. I'm getting some rustling, okay. A little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, That's a little better. I'm sorry, Actually, go ahead, Jamie. I, well, go ahead. Well, go ahead if, Jamie. if you looked at Petapix or yeah, Petapixel this week, like they had the story about the Snapchat things, and like it was, it was a funny conundrum if you read through the headlines because have you guys seen in the like, I don't know what it was. It was like some outlandish festival, let's say, where people were running around with optional clothing choices and things like that and some somebody had these stickers made up that said ask first hmm. and it was you know basically saying that photographers shouldn't be just walking around and making photographs of people when they're at these big festivals if they're half clothed and things like that I guess the genesis of the videos came about because people were actually getting groped at this and so they were getting touched in inappropriate ways and so they said like ask first before you touch someone which I think is valid <laughs> but it's this photographer defended it I believe and said you know well that's how we should be and the comments on that particular article are so incredible <laughs> just spend like 20 minutes reading these photographers argue about what consent is and when you look at that, and then you look at the, I did not click on this article, and to the editors of Petapixel, I think the fact that you put this preview photo in there was just mean for people who don't like snakes, but there's a picture <laughs> of the guy who got the photograph of the black mamba biting him, like, in a split second. It was horrible. I don't know what the, oh, the one photographer or the article was yeah. about, but <laughs> the, um, but, like, that happened in a blink of an eye. Yeah. And if people are running around with these, you know, sunglasses on, you're never going to know if somebody's videotaping you or not. You're, you're, we're, we're getting into a really fuzzy line of consent and people being able to be super creepy with their sunglasses. And we, this is probably opening up a larger conversation, I think, than just they look really cute. I mean, if somebody's got a GoPro on top of their head or on top of their helmet, you can see that. But yeah. if somebody's got a pair of sunglasses on, they just might look trendy and you wouldn't know that you're being videotaped. Yeah. Well, you'll know you're being videotaped or at least you'll know that someone has video camera glasses because these are very distinctive in, in how they look. Um, but, you know, you bring up a good topic with regard to the consent issue. And I was thinking about talking about that. But I mean, it's something sort of we've talked about before, but you know, let me get your take on it. Mark, what do you think about consent with regard to shooting people? 
Well, in regards to that festival and that specific example, you know, obviously I work for a daily newspaper. We're not going to run nudity in our paper, but uh, but I guess if if I'm there documenting the event and it's a public event, you know, uh, you know, editorially, uh, everything is fair game if it's happening, you know, in a in a park or in you know some kind of no. If it's on private property, you know, admission is uh, you know, paid admission. Uh, then I think you know people have a right to sort of expect that, that they're going to be asked their permission, but, but not, uh, not in public, you know, and then we run into this all the time, you know, covering new scenes where, uh, you know, it's happening on a public sidewalk, uh, public street, uh, you know, it's, it's fair game editorially to, to photograph what's happening. Yep. You know, our, our newspaper has, has a lot of uh, strict guidelines in what we will and won't print. Uh, and those decisions get made later, but my job is to is to capture the moment. Yeah. So you ever get people coming up to you and telling you not to take their picture, and then you telling them, "Well, I can take your picture." Or you know, how do you uh, yeah, explain that? It doesn't happen all the time, and you know, and frankly, when I'm you know cruising around looking for what we call wild art or daily features, and I stop in the park and I see a mom and kid playing, and I walk up and say, "Hey, oh, it makes a cute picture. Can I take your picture?" And the mom says, "No, absolutely not." No, I'm not going to argue and say, but you're in a public park. I have every right. You know, and that's when the police come. And, that's yeah. right. And then I'm, and then and then I'm, the, a, I'm the creepy guy with a camera. Man, exactly. You're not doing anything wrong. No, yeah. that's right. But of course, of course, I'm going to respect when somebody just, you know, says, hey, I really, no, I really don't want to be photographed. I don't want to be in the paper. Absolutely, I'll walk away. But, you know, the difference is the new scenes. And I would say that historically, the thing I find most interesting as, about being a photojournalist, I'm kind of curious if... Uh, um, if, if others have heard this too, that when I'm at a scene when something tragic has happened, let's say it's a, a house fire, um, and I'm across the street photographing it, and I see the family members perhaps uh, you know near me, and I might be shooting pictures, they might. <clears throat> I don't ever worry about them coming up and confronting me because you know what? Frankly, their house is on fire, or they've had this tragedy happen they've got bigger things on their mind. They've, obviously, there are terrible things happening in their life, and they're not even probably noticing me. But I always am concerned about neighbors and family and friends who might see me. And I, I try to stay open to somebody coming up to me and saying, you know, why are you taking pictures? You're, uh, you know, you're taking advantage of this situation. And, I, and I'll politely you know, try and say, well, I'm, you know, I just need to document it, but I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I won't, you know, intrude on that family's grief. Uh, thanks for, thanks for your concern. Yeah. But yeah, I, I worry more about sort of those tangential people, like neighbors, uh, who might, you know, they're feeling hopeless, seeing their friends or their neighbors, you know, in distress, and they're trying to find a way to help. And, and a lot of times, the way they want to help is by coming and telling the the working photojournalists to, to stop doing what they're doing. Mark Dolan, um, if you guys are familiar with him, he's the former president oh, yeah. of NPPA. Yeah. Mark used to say to people, like, there are only two people here doing a job, me and the firefighters. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here to yeah. the people that would give him grief? And they'd be like, you're just sitting here being a vulture watching this thing go down. Like, that's rubbernecking. Yeah. At least I'm here because I have to be. The, the 45 people with their cell phone cameras out at some scene, why aren't you bothering them? Like, I clearly am here doing a job. What I always love, and I probably told this story a million times, is that uh, I was covering Chicago, uh, uh, the NATO protests, and uh, and I was, me and uh, C.S. Muncie and other guests of ours and friend of ours uh, were photographing a girl who had gotten hit by a police car that had just driven off. And we wanted to document it. This actually happened, even though the Chicago police denied it, because we actually witnessed it happen. Um, they, uh, we photo were trying to photograph her because she was down on the ground and she had gotten injured, not like really, really seriously, but enough that she had to go to the hospital. And all of the like medics and all of the, if you guys covered Occupy at all, like the, the all the other protesters gathered around her mm -hmm. and stopped us from photographing. And we kept trying to explain, she's going to want these photos. Mm -hmm. She's going to want documentation that this happened. Well, they prevented us. They tried to, they actually tried to, the first time I've ever gotten into a fight in my entire life <clears> happened <throat> that night. I had to jump up on a sick guy that was six foot four from behind, try to pull him away from uh, trying to bash my, uh, uh, bash CS's uh, 
I think D3 asked at that point. So very Period. expensive camera. Yeah, no. Uh, thank God he yeah, had. You always have confrontation stories when I'm on here. That's all. Uh, <laughs> little known fact: It's the Are same you just story. angry all the time and just getting in rumbles, like rumbles that's, everywhere you go? That's <laughs> like, my beat. That's my beat. Um, I'm covering New York Comic Con uh, uh, this weekend, so please do not punch like Yoda or something like that. I'm, okay, buddy. I'm, I'm actually credentialed, and if I cause any problems, they won't credential me next time. And this is a eight month long process to get this credential. You so, do know that, like, a lot of those Comic Con guys who dress up in cosplay, like, they practice on whatever <laughs> video game, war game thing that they have. So you're going to get your ass beat. No, they they love it. <laughs> I, I, the, the great thing is, I work for comicbook.com. Like, oh, yeah. literally, all I have to say is, I work for comicbook.com and I have everybody on the planet, like, swarm around me. It's the best. Yeah, he's like the world over there. So. Oh, yeah. He's like the new Republic at Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But but anyway, after that, the she actually put a post up on Facebook. The girl had gotten hit, calling asking out for people, pictures, asking for photos, and and so <laughs> whenever these things happen, that's all I ever think about um, is that. And I go, you know, I've covered Electric Daisy Carnival before, uh, that big thing. Obviously, that's a ticketed event, so not in a public space. But I always either I either like wave and like make really obvious that I'm taking a photo. <laughs> So that people know, and and usually they'll go no, they'll block their face or something. Then I just won't take the photo because honestly, like if it's not a news event, it's just not. In any, that's why like at this BDSM thing, like I've covered similar type events. I worked as a burlesque photographer for a couple years, um, and uh, well, not my only work. It was one of the things I did, <laughs> um, but. Um, and it's always. Wait, could it's you define not, that? Were you a burlesque photographer or a photographer of burlesque? Photographer of burlesque. Okay. I, I was not on stage taking <laughs> photos as I stripped. No one, I can promise you, no one wants to see that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there's, there's probably somebody who wants to see that. No, 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 no. So, um, what do you think of these uh, Snapchat glasses? Do you think they're they're going to be the next big thing? I, I like these. I like the idea of where it's going. There's uh, one of my favorite comic books is this comic book by Warren Ellis called uh, Transmetropolitan, and it's uh, basically uh, Hunter S. Thompson in the year 3000, um, and he has these glasses that he always wears. They're green and red. And they photograph. All he literally goes is like this, and it takes a snapshot, or he holds it, and it takes video. And it takes like high quality video. Obviously, it's the year three thousand. But I like that the idea that if I could be a live streamer, and be shooting, and be working, and not have some freaking GoPro with a cell phone connection and a, and a satellite dish, and be running around like Tim Pool, like having things hanging off me, and being really obvious that I'm also live streaming everything. I think for like a lot of the stuff that I cover. That would be fantastic um, for, you know, I mean, for like things like BDSM events and stuff like, you know, whatever that type of events, I think that is creepy. Um, I personally would not do it. And that's one of the problems with these. It's all personal ethics. Um, I, I'm super, because I got my kind of my start as an activist and I worked my way into journalism. So I understand the idea of uh, people not wanting to take their photos. But on the other hand, I've also gotten to fights with, uh, Black Block before where I was trying to take their photo when they were releasing uh, air from police tire, <laughs> police cars, you know, from the tires of a uh, police uh, uh, that I was actually standing on at the time. But that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I think though this brings up a question for Mark though, because you're, yeah. you know, you're working for a daily and yeah. the, the worry that I have with certain things like this is every time this new emerging technology comes out, everybody looks to the media and especially the editors and publishers, I think, and say, you know, we need to have stuff faster now. You yeah. have the technology so we can have it immediately. And I'm, you know, this, I can't believe I'm gonna reference this in a journalism show, but this whole like, last night I was kind of shocked that I went on to NPR and I learned about Ms. Kardashian's gunpoint <laughs> hold up. And it was funny because when I went and checked the other news sources, the headlines were, she's been held up. But uh, like NPR and a few other places use the actual correct phrase of allegedly has been held up. We don't have any information. And I feel like the faster we're reporting on some of these things, the greater likelihood for error, the greater mm -hmm. likelihood for, you know, just un undue stress on a staff. So if, if this thing takes off, Mark, would this be something that, you know, you could see your publisher saying, like, everybody needs those. Let's start doing all this coverage and giving it to reporters. 
Uh, my publisher's not watching, right? Of course not. <laughs> we got one viewer. So <laughs> could be him. You know Let's talk about the Denver that. Post then. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that the publishers of the Denver Post, uh, you mentioned, <laughs> yes, love this kind of technology. They love they love new stuff. You know, they love video. They love anything that's that's maybe the, something they think is going to save sort of the, the the downward progression of of of, of, ju of print journalism. Um, so so yeah, if my if my publisher said you're going to wear these glasses, heck, I'll find a way to to <laughs> wear them and to and to do it happily and to make great images. Um, but uh, but I I I, I hope uh, personally I hope that. It doesn't come, but I, it's a good question, Jamie. See, see yeah. I think the I think the really important thing that that if if publications are looking at like this technology, whether it be Google Glasses comes out with a new thing, or whether Instagram video stories now pick up the thing, so it's not just these temporary Snapchat stories or whatever. Um, what I think is a few is is the problem is is connecting the the live stream moment by moment event and then also covering the like in depth behind it. So you yeah. can cover like my my thing was always you know trying to snap photos as I going along, say covering a, a protest or whatever. That's my like momentary thing, and hopefully a publication will you know embed those or whatever. And then later on, I get to tell the entire story of the evening within the context of the entire night, as opposed to a, a person got hit by a cop car. Well, within the context of the whole night, it was a it was a really really peaceful protest. I don't think there was any uh, arrests, you know, I mean like nothing that I witnessed. But if you just say these one this one 10 second snap, um that's extremely dangerous. That's and that's where news starts going into the citizen journalism territory, <laughs> you know, where it's just like and then that be the thing that like like what you were saying, Jamie, about uh you know, NPR being the only one adding the alleged to the phrase and the, all the other publications, especially entertainment publications, going by what her press person said, um, that this happened, there's no doubt about it, and we're not even asking what the police said. Because also, by the way, her press person, <laughs> I literally read one story on this, I promise. Her, her press person actually said, hooded men uh, uh, broke into her room, and then later on, now it's people dressed as police officers. So there's a whole ongoing thing that this is starting to feel like, something up there is kind of questionable, but. Well, I don't know, does anybody you know. remember what happened during the first 24 hours of Benghazi? Oh well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, we could, we need to be a little bit more yeah. circumspect in the face of chaos, I yeah. think. And, and I, and I that, that's where I really wish that, I wish that my generation and kind of like whatever, that, that we'd actually support newspapers and support publications that aren't 100% reliant on this like, moment by moment getting the first story in, getting the getting the photos transmitted before we even know what the actual story is behind that image and posting something so that like you know i would say probably 90 percent of news um can wait till the next day <laughs> I, I know that's really really dangerous to say i mean but i work in You're like half of the listening audience you're like well but then i don't have a job i work no but i work i mean i work in long form i i work as a my my main job that i that make income that I pay for my cameras, um, for the most part, is long form investigative journalism. I work for the, lat, the the film that's up in theaters right now. I worked on for two years um, doing, wow. and that story I worked on for six months alone. And so, like this idea that like that story needs to break right now, you know, is just something that's so alien, <laughs> so completely out of the blue for me uh, that it's always been really tough as a photojournalist. Where I'm like, no. No, you need to wait for the write up behind the photos before those things before they actually make any sense. But yeah, anyway. I'm, I'm intrigued by the Snapchat software and the hardware. Uh, I don't use Snapchat anymore. I was experimenting with it at first, but then Instagram stories came out. So then I dropped Snapchat. So I won't be buying these for necessarily Snapchat. But I'm sure when Instagram copies it or when Facebook <laughs> decides to copy it yep. and I can do my Facebook live feed or my Instagram stories from some head mounted video device, then I'm going to be all about it. I'll, if it's cheap enough, I'll definitely get a pair. Um, I think $130 is almost at that impulse price. I think once it gets down to about $99, uh, it'll be something that, you know, you'll just get. And then if you can choose your style, obviously, because not everybody likes that weird reflective <laughs> colored glasses, but I guess they want to make sure that when you see them, it's like pronounced, like, you know, these are the Snapchat glasses. So watch out. You're being, you might be being filmed. Yeah. Um, 
as far as their their uh, capacity for you know documentation and whatnot, I think you know as of they are right now, you know they're a cute little you know devoid device <laughs> side thing, but I could definitely see them being utilized, you know, again in live streaming or perhaps you know like for instance in um, you're at a protest or something, you can have that be recording continuously, giving you sort of you know obviously that that live cinema verite feel and also as a sort of recording backup just in case you know anybody tries to accuse you of something so you have that so i think there are definitely some some utility for glasses worn cameras i just don't think this has any place at least in my life for documentation but you know it'd be interesting to see how people augment this uh this technology and do their own diy type um, experiments with it and getting it utilized for different capacities. I definitely think people are going to play with it. Um, so I'm intrigued by, you know, see where it goes. Somewhere there's like a Google executive that came up with Google Glass that's like banging his head against the desk <laughs> right now. Like, we yeah. did that. We did yeah. it for you and nobody bought it. Yeah. Well, they also charge $1,500 for it. So, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And only gave them out to like really special people at start. So, I mean, that's one of the big <laughs> problems. Like, so. Yeah. All yeah. right. I, well, I am, can I can I jump in because yeah, I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to surprise myself in defense uh -oh. of, in defense of, of these glasses, Snapchat glasses. Here we go. Here's why I would love them. Sure. Just be at the Olympics, and and this happens every day. Those of you who photograph maybe celebrities or you know, politicians, when the public gets to meet an Olympic athlete, you know, after they're they finish competing or just you know a celebrity. What do they do when they first go meet that athlete or that celebrity these days? Instead of walking up and shaking their hand, and say, hey, look at you, there you go, Zach. Instead of shaking their hand, say, it's so nice to meet you. Oh. They, turn their, they turn their back to this person who they are so thrilled to be next to and take a picture of themselves with the person behind them and make no contact. Okay, yeah. here we go, Snapchat glasses, face to face. Yeah. You can go up. And no, they're no, going to take off the glasses. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they'll we'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, seen, here we go. I do like the yeah. idea then of that face to face. You know, you are wearing, unfortunately, these creepy looking sunglasses yeah. as you're interacting with your hero. But uh, but I like the idea of that. Do you think they made them sunglasses because the like you know PPI on them is, is so low or the quality is so low that I right, it's not PPI. Video, but CPI? This, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that the that the quality is so low that you just shouldn't use it in the dark. So they were like, we're not going to make them glasses. We're going to make them sunglasses. You have to be outside, or else you'll kill yourself. I will say, I think the biggest sort of innovation, or at least interesting thing that comes to, with this uh, these glasses, is the circular uh, recording capability. Because yeah. now it's like whether it's like horizontal or vertical, like you <laughs> see, you can you can determine which like this, orientation <laughs> you want to actually see the picture at. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's a good idea because I get so tired of seeing vertical video in <laughs> things. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. People, come yeah. on, turn your camera sideways, please. Before we go uh, to the next topic, Mark, have you seen that amazing photo of uh, Hillary Clinton uh, standing on a box? It was on reading. If you go to reading with pictures. Okay. Uh, reading from picture, whatever the I forget what he cha Mark changed his site to, uh, but um, there's this great um, photo of Hillary Clinton standing on top of a box, and every <laughs> single person in the yeah. audience is faced the opposite way, getting a <laughs> selfie with themselves. Every single person in the crowd. That there's not great. a single person looking at her, and she's just kind of like desperately looking, like what the <laughs> hell is going on. <laughs> Which is kind of her entire so, face this entire election, but <laughs> just you know that was a staged photo in that she told them all to get that selfie. Oh, she photo. did do that. Oh, okay. yeah. okay. that, was on, that was on purpose. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then they took a photograph of that, and then everybody's like, "Oh my God, look at today's youth!" Yada yada, yada millennium generation. <laughs> yeah, and, and she, and, but she but she then goes gets to go. Hey, look at the young people like me. The young people like me. Anyway, we are not talking about the election at this show. That was not a part of the deal for this week. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> yes, tune into our, our sister podcast, PolitiChat. <laughs> start up Give us an hour long break from it. <laughs> I know, right? So next up in Trump news. <laughs> anyway. All right. So actually, we've got you just came from speaking of politics. I know we didn't say we wouldn't talk about this. 
You just came from a Trump rally, didn't you, Mark? I did. I was covering uh, Trump is in Colorado, two two appearances today, and I was uh, photographing him down in Pueblo. Um, and it's interesting because Jamie, you were asking about that sort of immediacy. So yeah, these days when I cover an event like that, yes, you know, I'm on a riser, uh, you know, photographing just what's going on. But uh, but I'm also you know tweeting from my camera, you know, shooting pictures of people outside waiting to come in. Shooting pictures of protesters on my on my phone. I'm sorry, I keep saying camera, uh, and just tweeting stuff uh, directly off of my phone. And then as soon as I get in, as soon as he's on the stage, yes, I'm you know I've got my laptop out and I'm I'm transmitting photos from the event as they as they happen. It's just part of our gig these days. I'm sure Zach knows that. Oh yeah, yeah. Have you got? By the way, have you gotten your uh, um, uh, Trump coin? Oh, I forget, I forget who the guy hey, is that's funny. actually selling about. I, I've covered enough of them that uh, uh, they uh, they're like ten bucks. There's a member the member the press who sells them. Uh, um, so <laughs> I'll have to go look. That's, uh, that's cool. It's so also no. a bottle. It's also a bottle opener too. So you know. <laughs> but but yeah, you, need, you probably need a drink after a Trump rally. Well, uh, out of respect for Jamie, I'm not going to talk about the Trump rally. Is that? <laughs> and the audience. Did you get heckled much while you were there? No, the it's day? funny. He he he. You know, I've seen examples where he you know he really likes to. To kind of get the crowd turning on uh, on the media because we're yeah. we're a pretty easy target, but uh, no, that didn't that didn't happen. Good, good. I, I did right, I man. did I did have somebody yell at me and say, "Are you selling bumper stickers?" I was up on a riser with a camera, and I don't know why he thought I'd be selling bumper stickers. <laughs> I'm not surprised. That was my strangest moment today. <laughs> All right. So our next topic this week, uh, and you know, good, good since we just spent the last um, half hour talking about, you know, gear. Let's talk about how important gear is. So uh, there's this uh, filmmaker named Simon Cade. Uh, he was talking about his relationship with gear, and essentially the idea that better gear won't make him a better filmmaker. Uh, excuse me, but you know, being a better filmmaker. Being a better filmmaker will make him a better filmmaker. So understanding, you know, lighting and, um, you know, how to, how to cut at it and whatnot will make him better. So, you know, obviously I know we're talking here mostly with photographers, um, but, you know, what is our relationship with technology? Do we have to have the greatest stuff? How do we convince people that, you know, it's not the camera so much as it's, you know, what's in your head? Um, and, you know, how have you sort of dealt with your sort of, what's your, relationship to gear and technology do you have to have the greatest stuff right now right here do you are you okay with what you have do you, are you okay using older stuff do you get envious of people who have new stuff what what's your take and sort of feeling about you know gear how about you mark why don't you go ahead and start what, what's the what's the newspaper giving you to shoot with these days so we have uh, right now d4s and d4s's uh i was able to pick up a, a d5 um so I, i've been an icon shooter for a long long time uh, actually, my whole career, and I'm not—I don't get anything from Nikon. I'm just a, just a big believer in Nikon. Uh, so I guess I tend to fall on on the fact that it's you know when when people ask me how to you know how to make great pictures, I'm talking about things like you know subject, you know lighting, framing, emotion. Uh, I, I'm talking about those things, and I don't think I've ever said to somebody. Well, you've got to get you know the best camera and the latest gear, and boy, you've got to try this and you got to try that. You know, for me, it's 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 those things that go into making a great picture, uh, not not the gear. That being said, you know, Nikon kindly, you know, they did this with a lot of photographers. Well, not a lot, but a group of photographers going to the Olympics. They you know they called and said, hey, you know, what could we put in your hands to cover the games? They, you remember those days when. Uh, uh, the Olympics, I don't remember if it was Atlanta or which Olympics it was where they, somebody shot a picture of all the white Canon lenses in a row at the yeah, Olympic Games. Yeah. Nikon doesn't want that to happen again. So, so they, uh, they're very generous in, in learning gear out. So I, I had a couple of D5s and the new 400 28. And of course, I'm all about having that. I want to have good equipment. And, you know, there's that equipment helped me to shoot better pictures at these games. But the pictures I made, I, I believe, are not all thanks to the gear. Um, I like to think that they have to do with me being in the right place, uh, me knowing the sports, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and me doing my job and letting the camera do its, do its job. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. I mean, have you noticed uh, the D5 providing you 
I guess a uh, like have you been able to leverage its um, upgrades to has it enhanced your oh. your image taking capability? I, absolutely. I, you know, my percentages at these Olympic Games were you know of in focus, you know, catching the, the the key moment. Those percentages went went up. You know, I mean, you go to twelve frames a second, and you got this incredible. You know, it's a new autofocus system that has many many less misses, especially with the. Uh, you know, I was mostly using a 400 to 8, uh, the new 400 to 8, which also was lighter, which I'm also all about. Um, <laughs> yes. Anything that uh, has me carrying a little bit less uh, less weight, but no, definitely the the new the, the D5 definitely, you know, raised my game. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm I'm just about. To, I think I've got one more football game to shoot with those lens, with those cameras, and then I've got to ship them back to Nikon. But uh, oh, the D5s. Yeah, so I'll keep. I'm keeping. I, I have one of my own, but uh, but I'm a little sad to 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 be shipping them back. Um, you know, but it's funny. I'm sorry, Jamie. I, I know you probably want to weigh in on this, but uh, um, you know, I'm I'm saying that you know, on the one hand that it's it's those things that we learn as photographers to improve our craft, which don't have anything anything to do with the gear. Um, but if I was, you know, I have a, I'm, I'm a terrible home repair guy, um, but I do have an electric, you know, battery powered drill. Well, every time I go to use that drill, it's obviously one I got for a hundred bucks or 79 bucks at the hardware store. The battery's always dead. It never holds a charge. It's hard to, you know, it's just as, is a, is a crappy drill. If I was a professional, you know, working in home repair, I would not, I would, I would want to have a dependable great drill that's not making me you know a, a, a better professional at that job it just is what's necessary to do to do the work so you know I, I guess gear is not critical to me but you know I want to have the gear that's going to stand up to, to what I'm doing was well, the newspaper gonna upgrade you to d5s well I'm about to put in a budget proposal for next year so, <laughs> so but you know these are these are these are lean times uh, yeah but they've they've done a good job in the last couple of years of kind of keeping us somewhat you know current, uh, which is which is good. I, I don't have any big complaints. And if we don't get D fives, you know I'm fine with D fours. I love the the D three for me was the was the game changer for my industry. You know, not having to you know beginning with the D three um, came to a time where ISO began to become irrelevant. You know, and now with the D five at you know twelve thousand ISO. It's pretty pretty phenomenal. I, I would say that at these games, I don't think I ever shot slower than two thousandth of a second, wow. um, which is pretty unusual for indoor, you know, indoor sporting events. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Jamie, what do you think about newest and latest greatest technology? Well, <laughs> um, I, I think for sports photographers, it makes a lot of sense. Like it really does. I I, I remember one time. <laughs> I was, I was, you know, I, I predominantly photographed Capitol Hill and the White House, and I remember I was talking to, I think it was like Quay Bowie or somebody from Newsweek, and I think it was Quay because he's the person who would say something like this, and I said like, I think I, I need, I can't remember what I needed. I needed something faster, and he was like, Jamie, we photograph his words. That old white men. It's not like they're moving very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know what, you're right. Like, I don't need the latest and greatest. And when I was an independent photographer, I didn't have that luxury of having somebody just hand me new gear all the time. But I think if you're going to use it and you're going to use it effectively, because we kind of talked about this last time I was on, like the gear that you use is the most important gear that you have. So if you're going to use all of the aspects and range of a camera, then yeah, absolutely do it. But if you're only if you're only using ten percent of it of its potential, and you're not even I mean, seriously, this is like drives me bonkers with our students. If you're not even going to read the manual to figure out how to use some of the functionality that's available to you, and you're just going to be like, oh look, f stop shutter speed ISO. <laughs> All righty, I got it set. Maybe I'll do a custom white balance. Like. Then who gives a crap what camera you're using? You might as well just figure out how to use something else on the generation before that, before you need to upgrade. But yeah. like from the video perspective, like if it makes sense for the image that you're producing, 
if you are producing something like uh, Drew Geraci, if you guys are familiar with him, he's a photographer, videographer for District 7 Media. Um, he's brilliant and he's a huge gear hound. He's always photographing like the new thing that he got, but he, he photographs for like, you know, or videos for House of Cards and the NFL and MTV and his stuff's up on jumbotrons. Like it needs to be really good and really strong and he needs to have the latest technology and the 4K or 12K or whatever the heck we're up to now in video. But for a lot of people, if you're photographing on recycled tree bark and <laughs> it's only gonna go onto the media, you know, the internet at 72 DPI, then, you know, is it really necessary to have the video quality video camera? But I will, I'll throw out another shout out. I think I did this last time too. Like Annie Flanagan, if you're familiar with her work, Annie Flanagan's brilliant. She just won like another grant for her work. She goes out and she buys used film cameras at like used thrift stores. She uses Polaroids. She really mixes up her gear. And when it comes to gear and the gear that you use, I personally think that whatever keeps you creative is the most important piece in your bag. So if you can find a way to be as creative as possible, I mean, charcoal sketches if you want to, but if you can find some way to be creative with it, that I think is the most important piece of technology that you can play around with. Yeah. And if it doesn't open up some new creative avenue for you, then why bother? You know, this yeah. guy in this uh, video, you know, talking about his, his nature and, um, his relationship with technology is using a, a Canon T3i and you know, he's just doing it to document, you know, film and, and you know that camera can shoot 1080p, which is still a relevant um, resolution mm -hmm. and will be probably for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, for him, he doesn't need like the latest, greatest 5k autofocus. Uh, what do you think, Zach? Um, I mean, uh, for his, for his story, absolutely. Um, I mean, when I worked at BNH and &H and Adorama and all these places, I actually told most people who are starting out as filmmakers, especially kind of like what he's doing. I said, just get yourself a T3i, even as a Nikon, a, you know, NPS member, everything like just get yourself a T3i, you know, <laughs> you use the cheaper lenses. You can buy them now for like $300 and the video was amazing and they're super easy to use. Um, I myself though. <laughs> just picked up um, this JVC 4K, and it is, uh, as far as I can tell, the cheapest 4K video camera uh, that has XLR inputs, because obviously if you're shooting, like, if you're doing video journalism, that's necessary. It's not even an yeah. option. Um, on the market, it's 1200 bucks or 1295, uh, okay. and it comes with a mic, comes with everything. This actually comes right off, like, so okay. it actually, I can go super low, low key, that's also the big thing for me is that it's not like a shoulder cam and everything like that. So, I mean, but I've had my D600s for years now. The le For me, gear is the lenses and maybe like I just upgraded my, my memory cards. <laughs> like that's really where I spend my money. I spend my money on travel as much as humanly yeah, you possible. You got those new one terabyte cards, right? You know? uh, yeah, right. Uh, another third. <laughs> no, I will no. this is the problem now. 4K, I just looked up what the stat was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes me cry because I've got a ton of, I got, I've gotten into arguments with people about not ever getting like 32 gigs for stills. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe with the D5, maybe it's a little bit different, but for stills, you're kind of crazy carrying anything else more and around in your pocket, especially with the D600 that has two of them. So if you're going to shoot more than 64 gigs at an, at, at an event and not switch out your cards, then... I, I'd be freaking out. Like, <laughs> like I've lost I've lost cards before by accidentally being like, oh yeah, I already dumped those onto my hard drive, delete, clear all, and then realizing, oh, I just lost four hours of the Democratic National Convention. Whoa. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, that, that that was an example. Luckily that did not actually happen. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, for gear, it just ends up being again what's necessary. I mean, like, yeah, did I did I want to buy the like the Sony 4K that's like 4,800 bucks that has all the nice you know added features and everything like that on it that had wireless whatever? Um, yeah, of course I wanted to. But this is the only thing I need because I'm shooting I'm shooting low budget documentaries that 
I'm usually I'm more than likely going to be going into like potentially violent er areas where I'm going to get robbed or whatever. And I just want to lose a fourth. I just want to lose a twelve hundred hour camera if that's what's going to happen. Um, and that's it, you know. And I did my research, and that's what I bought. And I'll probably have that until I had I had a Sony Z1U that shot MIDI DV tapes. I I shot. I used that up until two years ago, and that came out in two thousand and six um, because it worked, and it gave me everything I needed in a video camera. Um, so, you know, gear wise. Use what you want. Um, I mean, I will say anything that makes your life easier. If somebody gave me a D5 tomorrow, yes, I would take that. <laughs> I would take that lens. When I, when I was lucky enough to be at the DNC and I'm an NPS member and I was able to walk down there and go, can I get the 400 millimeter 2.8 or the, I don't even remember. I'm looking at the lens now on Instagram because it's the reason I blew out my back. Um, <laughs> Trying to handhold it above my head with, oh. the, with the D's. Well, I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> Thank I don't. You, know. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. You can go on my Instagram page and see the photos I got with it. I, I am, I'm more than happy with what I got. It's unbelievable. The D750 that has the LC. I mean, like things like the D750. How do you even know what you're focusing on at that point the, when you're the, that zoomed in? Live view. D750 um, with the uh, LCD. I see that. Those are the little things that I'm like, mm -hmm. now I kind of want a D750. But because I can actually see and I can do over the headshots, which you've, Mark, you've covered a, a Donald Trump event. A lot of Hail Marys. Yeah. Exactly. So that's literally where I'm like, that I could have a monopod and be able to just shoot it, you know, remotely or do something. I mean, so, I mean, that's, that's where it all comes down to. Does it make my life easier? And then I do a value added thing. And then I go, hopefully, if, is, does my credit card have enough space? <laughs> and then that's it. <laughs> You've made me want to, you give me a new goal. I'm going to someday do a Hail Mary with a 400 2 <laughs> I'm telling new, you, you can do goal. it. Nuts. You have to do, you have to do <laughs> a lot of like lift weights. That's why I actually have a five pound weight right next to my camera. I literally just do this all day when I'm not, when I'm just like, you know, waiting for Premiere to load or something. So. I have five pound weights on my desk too. There you go. <laughs> I'm surprised you went with, you know, was it the XLR the only reason you went with the dedicated video camera device, like a, a digital SLR well, that she's with you? See, I have, I already have the uh, uh, the Tascam, which works really great if you're attached to a tripod. Uh, but I was shooting a bunch of, uh, our, our, our film is premiering and I was shooting these little, like it's it was fantastic to be able to shoot like in a movie theater and shoot people like talking. Uh, because obviously this video camera probably wouldn't be able to do the low light in a movie theater setting. Um, but the problem was is that I couldn't, I can't get the sound, the microphone on that's attached to the top of the camera to stop making noise. Mm -hmm. And then there's just some other issues like the task cam box that I have that goes to the, that attaches. Um, it takes four AA batteries and it go, it, it blows out in an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. So I, I covered a I covered a NR, the NRA convention and and uh, Donald Trump was an hour late. So I kept recording every time somebody would come on stage. And by the time Donald Trump came on stage, I had 15 minutes of audio left on that on those double A batteries, and I had to switch out. And there's just there's a lot of problems. There's the task game recorder that I have is super cheap, but it's not. I needed something that I can just hit play and then let it play for an hour and 15 minutes or let it record for two hours as long as the battery life lasts, which I have a four hour battery now. So that's the big thing with the DSLRs, at least for Nikons. I know mm -hmm. Canon has a little bit better and I know Sony is on a whole different thing, but then I'm not buying a whole nother cam DSLR system. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. You know, speaking of gear, uh, Mark, did you see anything other than Canon and Sony at the Olympics or uh, Canon and Nikon? All Canon and Nikon. And you know, it, it, no still photographers. You can't shoot video at the Olympic venues. TV pretty much has that obviously wrapped right. up, sewn up. They pay for it. They deserve it. Uh, which, which I think, if if somehow that was allowed, I think I'd see more Sony uh, for for live sports events. Uh, but no, all all Nikon and Canon all the way around. Nobody had like a, a Panasonic or a Fuji or anything. I saw Kodak. some. I saw some Fujis. I saw you know a couple of pan. Yeah, not not very much at all, mm -hmm. and a lot of it was just that kind of extra camera for somebody. Yeah, um, but but pretty much it's and I'd say right now fifty fifty Canon and Nikon 
in, in that realm. Okay. Uh, I personally, uh, my, my relationship with gear has sort of changed over time. I, I had the 5D Mark II like when it first came out. Uh, and I really haven't upgraded that. I don't plan to upgrade that. I've switched to the Panasonic and I've got the GH4 and I'll upgrade to the GH5 when that comes out. And, you know, I don't, um, I don't get into super expensive technology. Like I'll play around with new stuff. Like for instance, uh, I'm going to get the new Mavic drone. Hmm. I pre-ordered that. So I'll be getting that in October. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, using that as my first drone. But you know, that's the only reason I'm, I'm upgrading. Uh, with the camera and the video, I'm upgrading because essentially you can shoot 4K 60p on the new camera. You can shoot 10-bit recording, which is you know important for getting more depth within your video. So yeah, I only upgrade for feature functionality. You know that's coming out. I, you know, I, I, again, I wasn't going to upgrade to the the 5D Mark IV because it just didn't have what I was looking for. I'm a little disappointed in Canon personally, but. Yeah, as far as the gear goes, it doesn't matter. It, it just matters really what your technique is. And, you know, if it makes it makes you better at your technique or it opens up more, uh, expands your capabilities, then great. You know, it's why you get a new lens to get a different focal point, different viewpoint. Um, you know, but if it's going to do the same thing for you or like you said, you're not even going to read the manual and see what other features are out there, then, you know, stay with what you have. I mean, I would probably still continue to use the 5D Mark II if I weren't so in love with, you know, shooting 4K. But uh, yeah, 5D Mark II, great camera. Um, well, I think that I think and, Mark yeah. was right. There was a jump. Like the 6D, like as a, as a former Canon shooter, I, I shoot Leica mm -hmm. now, but as a former Canon shooter, or even Leica, I mean, the, the M8 compared to the M9 was just so remarkably different and everything changed during yeah. that jump that, you know, the, the subtle differences now, I mean, video, especially with the M, the M, the M9 to the M to the you know next generations is definitely different, but there there was a huge leap in Canon from that 6D to or the 5D. I mean, when the 5D came out, that was just awesome because it weighed less. Right. <laughs> um, but then you know the 5D Mark II, then to the 5D Mark III, and you know to the 5D Mark 12 that will eventually come out. It, I think it still comes down to like, are you going to use it? There's like a weird mean girls mentality sometimes when you get around a bunch of photographers and they start talking about gear and it's like, like gear shaming, I guess. Can we, can we make that hashtag? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where it's like, oh, well, I guess. I mean, I used to have the 5D Mark II, but now I've got the 12X9 II, and that one is like so much better because I have 100 extra pixels that I didn't need before. <laughs> oh my God, Becky, look at that camera. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I, potato. And it makes me sad because people waste their money. I mean, when you, Mar, or Zach, you were talking about it, like, seriously, don't make me come over there and just beat you over the head if you mention a credit card again. Because that's <laughs> the problem with what's happening to the generation of photographers that are coming out of school right now. They're already $100,000 in debt yep. that they're going to be paying off until they're 65 to the government. Why are we making them feel like they have to be spending an extra $20,000 in gear yeah. to be a good photographer? Like, yeah. Jesus, go out and find a used M6 that Versant used and learn how to be a really good still photographer with a manual lens and a manual camera. And you're going to be fine no matter what technology somebody puts in your hand. Yeah. No, that yeah, probably still on my Canon, so, you know. <laughs> Or that beautiful Canon AE. Remember the like AE yeah. two? Like ah, yeah. Every Canon shooter I know either had that or the what was it? The Nikon F two. F two. Mm -hmm. It was the exact same camera except one F2, was black. F two. F three. Well, how? And eight eighty eight. You can buy a you can buy a Nikon F five now for two hundred dollars. So <laughs> like I mean you can have like literally it's that's depressing <laughs> considering I bought mine for five hundred dollars. Um, but. Nobody's, like, nobody's gonna buy a film camera sorry no but i mean like it, i mean so w w when i worked at uh when i worked at bnh the the big thing i the biggest arguments that i ever got into with people was no you don't need to spend money on that thank god that was like kind of my proving point that we didn't work on commission which we don't um and, or we didn't at least i don't know what they do now but um was the fact that like no you don't need the you don't need this, you know, you don't need the 5D Mark III. You can you can make do with the 6D. You can, you know, I mean, like whatever the big thing was. And I'm like, 
well, why do you need that extra frame rate? I'm like, what are you doing? Or what do you need? Why do you need the video added feature when it was, uh, you know, uh, the the D7 700 was the best camera versus you know the something else, you know? Or why can't why why can't you? What what's wrong with the um, the used camera? Like why can't you buy the used camera versus the brand new one? You realize that this camera is rated perfectly. Just somebody opened up the box and then closed it, like. That's the only difference. <laughs> I mean, I, I buy I, all my uh, I buy all my lenses used now. I don't buy any new lenses. This is the first thing I bought new in since the uh, Sigma thirty five one four because you literally just can't. I have not been able to find that lens used uh, because well, the lenses back. Do you ever return that one lens you were uh, borrowing for review? I have not yet. No, I have not. <laughs> it's, been, it's been like six months. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel right. like possession is nine tenths of the law. And keep it. Mark, yeah. but like I see, I always felt that the lenses were the most important thing in my yeah. bag. Yeah. Do you feel that way, Mark, as a sports shooter? I mean, is it with the image stabilizing and stuff like that? I guess that's the most important thing, right? Absolutely. It's the it's the focal, it's the lens. It's you know, as long as you got sharpness, you know. Honestly, if somebody said I had to go back to the D3, I'd be happy with that. I'd go back that far with the camera. Camera's not that big of a deal to me, but but lenses, if they took away some of my yeah. fast, you know, prime lenses, I'd, I'd not be not happy. As long as you get that high frame rate, right? Yeah, but she's right though. I mean, it's 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 all about your vision and, you know, capturing your, your vision or the way you see things and how you want to communicate something. Um, if it's not in the sports realm, is more about the lens you're using. Is is more about the focal length than it is about uh, about frame rate and things like that. Definitely, definitely. All right, well, let's close up uh, this week with our gear segment. Although we've been talking about gear this entire show, um, the gear this week I was going to talk about was software, specifically Photoshop. You know, we all use Photoshop for the most part. Uh, if you deal with photos, it's an indispensable tool. And I found this uh, this video on Petapixel all about some tips and tricks about how to use it. And honestly, I've been using it since uh, I think five or six. Uh, Photoshop five or six was one of my first ones I learned on 5.5. I can't remember exactly. And I actually discovered new things that I never known you could do with the software uh, with these shortcuts. So, uh, you know, what I throw to you guys, um, you know, do you have any tips and tricks? Do you have any specific ways you use Photoshop that you know, might be able to enlighten our audience with? Any, any, um, shortcuts or anything, you know, the way that you use it. Zach, you go first. I, uh, I, I've, I've used Photoshop since like 2003 and I probably know less than a freshman in a community <laughs> college right now <laughs> because I aggressively have never, I use it mostly for design purposes, uh, like a layout on thing because uh, once Quark went away, which is, I know, I'm already aging myself. Sweet <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I, was, I was a damn expert in Quark. I could put together my school newspaper in under, like, three hours. Oh, my God, that was the most hellacious design program. I almost cried when InDesign came out. I was so happy. Oh I God, can't I believe you liked Quark. I can't stand in, in design at all. I, I don't understand what? it. There's just yeah, yeah. No, no. the problem is there's so many options. I just want to build a layout of a newspaper. Why the hell do I need 85 different freaking buttons? I need copy and paste. I need like import and I need some other things like, but, um, but Photoshop, I, I don't know. I, mean, I can't say it's been purposely uh, because whatever, mm -hmm. but I don't do, I don't do that much editing. I do everything in Lightroom. Lightroom's changed my life. <laughs> Lightroom made me be able to be a photojournalist as opposed to a guy who, a photo essayist, I'll say, a guy who eventually comes out with photos and publishes them somewhere, <laughs> which is how I used to be because it used to, t it would take me like an hour to edit a single photo, even just on the basic levels um, in Photoshop. And in Lightroom, I can blow through, you know, 150 photos in an hour easy. Um, you know, I, I used to work for the Village Voice, so a fifty, a hundred photos is a normal spread. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, so don't ask me about Photoshop. I have a, uh, I have a, a graphic design friend who, if I need any help on that, I just hit her up on uh, on uh, Facebook, and then she tells me what to do. So, 
So your your advice is find a friend on Facebook who knows how you use Photoshop. I, I, at this point, at this point, she's given up on trying to explain things, and I literally just send her. Usually, she's just send me the Photoshop file, and I'll do it for you. <laughs> so. Mark, you use uh, Photoshop on the regular, I'm sure, or, or yeah, something. What do you absolutely. use, and how, how do you uh, make the most out of it? Um, so we use a Photo Mechanic uh, to do our, you know, our, our quick editing. It's sort of our browser, and then launch photos into Photoshop. But you know, I work for a newspaper, you know, for a lot of years, and you know, it, our our ethical guidelines are are pretty much, you know, what you could have done with an enlarger, we're allowed to do in Photoshop. So lightening, darkening, using curves, uh, levels, uh, you know, and not much, and also you know, time is of the essence for most of what we do. So. I'm not. Yeah. So I'm speaking of time, I mean, do you, do you do you know any shortcuts? I mean, besides obviously the general ones, or do you have any special tips or techniques for for you know increasing your time? You know, I mean, I only have you know. There's things I don't do. I I, I generally, if I'm in a, a mixed lighting situation, or I, actually, I keep my camera shooting raw and JPEG most of the time. But I touch raw files maybe three or four percent of the time just because it's one extra step and if if I've nailed the white balance and you know every, exposures are good I'm not even touching the raw files uh, I just have them there kind of as a backup for when I when I screw the pooch uh, does your newspaper uh, require you to shoot raw or do you shoot raw? oh no 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 purposes? no we have no guidelines in fact they prefer I didn't because <laughs> we don't have we don't have room to store that and and you know everyone knows that raw just can sort of take you an extra step. So, yeah. you know, speed tricks, I don't really have them. I just I just know how to pick the pictures that are gonna, you know, communicate communicate what I want to communicate and, and hopefully are not gonna take any work to, to to you know to open them in Photoshop, caption them and get them out. Okay. Cropping. Jamie? Um well our workflow I think is is probably very similar to Mark's. We uh, we ingest in Photo Mechanic, and then I personally go directly to Adobe Camera Raw. Um, I love being a documentary photographer. I'm so not jealous of the fact that you don't touch raw because I just love the depth than clarity but again i i shoot with you know the leica m's and so they just have such incredible depth on those dngs that the adobe camera raw can do some really gorgeous stuff um i when i first got the camera i actually did a story that um i i did show to the leica users group about um like i shot in low light at night in india in the markets at um uh, i tried it i tried to do a whole shoot a whole like series um at three stops under to see how the dngs would perform mm -hmm. holy <laughs> sneakers batman it was awesome like it, it just the raws just popped right out of there you looked at the regular jpeg frame the initial preview frame and it was just black practically with little like tiny pinpoints of highlights but then when you really could pull the raw shadow and highlights out of there. I think it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, I, I feel the same way about gear that I do about technology, because if like, you don't have to shame everybody into getting the creative cloud or whatever, like you can do a lot of the same stuff that we all do in Photoshop. If you're only using 10% of it, then learn how to use that 10% the best way possible. But I personally think that the workflow itself is equally as important as how you're using photo mechanic and Photoshop together or Lightroom, you know, if you're using Lightroom. But I think that the workflow is something that people tend to forget about because they get so egotistically, narcissistically focused on their pictures in Lightroom or Photoshop that they kind of forget that, oh yeah, my files are still named DS underscore mm -hmm. one, two, seven, five, and nobody knows what the hell that is. And there's no metadata in there. So I tend to think, and, and at Momenta Workshops, we, we, we teach this pretty heavily because we have an archive of thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs from all the workshops that we've done. And it's really frustrating to me when you know, we'll get to the end of a workshop and I'll realize that somebody just 
threw all their stuff onto a folder on the hard drive and threw it into Lightroom and got all like chimpy with it and were like, ooh, I just want to go and see what it looks like. And they forget about the fact that it needs to be organized and it needs to be, you know, you have to have your metadata in there. You need your keywords in there. Any independent photographer will tell you that keywords are, God, I almost said key are incredibly important to <laughs> making certain that you can resell those things and find them. Like I just got a telephone call from somebody who wanted a, the entire archive of a day that I shot at Camp David with President Bush. That's how I'm going to date myself. <laughs> President Bush, like, I don't know, a decade ago. And all I have to do is go into my archive and, you know, look up the, prints that he was meeting with and find that day and send them the images and I get to make extra money off of it as opposed to being like, you know, 10 years ago, oh golly, can you please go into the New York Times dump folder that you put everything in and try to find that shoot you did when you shot, you know, when I shot like every single day of the week for them. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's just, I find that the Photoshop stuff is so incredibly minimal as long as you know what you're doing when you get in there and then you can take those get them to your newspaper get them to your agency get them to your clients as quickly as possible amen that's i i can't echo that enough that the idea and that's i'm so glad you talked about workflow because that's that is key i mean I, I i think that's that's a great tip I'm, I'm glad you glad you went to great lengths to to explain that well I, you know you, you aren't old enough you didn't did you ever shoot film Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> How so, dare you? So I just what, have excellent yeah. skincare. I guess. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Jamie, what did you do first thing when the film came came out of the processor? You went and started looking for those images that you knew you had and you wanted to find out if you got those moments. Yeah, but when I worked at the Post Standard, the first thing we did was grab a Sharpie and you'd have to go up to the little memo field at the top and put the assignment number, okay. your last name, and which number of film that was. Okay, well, that's great because I, I, I didn't have that discipline until we went digital <laughs> because, you know, for, for us, it was came out of the processor, you ran, you know, you ran to the light table and you go to find out if you got that picture sharp that you really wanted. Um, and when we went digital, we had, I had to, you have to relearn and say, okay, I'm going to put off looking at the images because if you start looking at the images, forget it. You're never going to go back and do the metadata and the, it's a black the, hole. the file naming. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the discipline of, uh, of getting that stuff taken care of before you start looking yeah. at the images. Good for you. I've never been so vindicated as I'll tell you guys a story from a momentum workshop. So we went to Northern India and it was like the second workshop in a row. And this photographer, Alison Harbaugh had taken a photograph. Like she had just done some, you know, enterprise street photography and she found this little boy and his brother that were begging in the streets. And, um, the, the younger brother was blind and, the older brother was leading him around. And I said, I recognize that kid. <laughs> and Allison looks at me in this like hilarious, you horrible racist kind of a way. And she was like, Jamie, not every little Indian boy looks alike. And I was like, last year, Robert L. Johnson photographed the same kid in the same <laughs> town. It took me less than three seconds because of our archiving system for me to go back in, pull up the last year's folder. I went into Robert L. Johnson student images folder, India 2000 and whatever it was, went into his daily, or I didn't go into his daily selects because we don't look at daily selects. We had his original selects and it was in the street photography section of his original selects. I think it took me like less than two minutes. And I was like, boop, 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 photo mechanic, here we go. And that's the same kid, right? And she was like, <laughs> but I mean, that's what archiving is supposed to be like. If you work at any newspaper, I mean, somebody's going to say like, oh my God, that Senator slept with which one of his interns? Can somebody please go see if we have a photograph of that person? And then next thing you know, you're the one who beats the news cycle. So I think I mean, that photograph of Clinton hugging Monica Lewinsky, quick. I actually was exactly thinking of that. I mean, yeah. like whoever the guy is, the photo researcher that found that photo must still be like a king in there, you know? 
But that's the, okay, so that's like, I just want to throw out one last thing that has nothing to do with gear or technology, but it has to do with process. Like you guys have both talked about storage options right now. And I realized like, you know, the huge server that we have was an investment. I mean, it was a couple thousand dollars probably. However, that isn't even like one prime lens that mm -hmm. people buy these days, but yet everyone is perfectly willing to just start dumping pictures that, oh, I guess I didn't like that because it was the back of the president's head hugging some random girl. <laughs> oh my God. The next thing Did you, you know, you've got the photo, you've got the picture that is going to be in the next news cycle. And whether you are a citizen journalist or whether you are working for a newspaper or a documentary photographer, I mean, I've I legitimately think that it's important to keep those images. I had somebody call me up and ask me if I had a picture of a building that had collapsed during an earthquake in India or in like Northern India because this building wasn't there anymore. And it was randomly in the back of a picture that I had in the back of a shoot one day that, you know, I was photographing something over here, but there it was. And that's what our job is, is to record history, not delete stuff that we, you know, today are capriciously saying we don't like. But that's my soapbox of the day. <laughs> I, I, as a person who, if I ever hit the lotto, the first thing I'm doing is hiring a, uh, a couple people to literally go through the dozens of hard drives, which I think I probably brought out my hard drives on, 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 <laughs> on film more than on the show more than once because everything's a complete and total mess. Um, <laughs> but, um, the, the number one thing that luckily my Occupy Wall Street stuff, I actually kept vaguely organized um, just because I felt, because I knew that there were so many people photographing it, but so few of them, it was either AP guys who I know how they work because I was friends with a couple of them. They pulled the important photos and then it went off into the ether or whatever, whether they even sent in their photos or whether they were kept somewhere, I don't know because there's no way for what they were shooting. I, I made sure I kept every single photo I ever shot by date, by time, everything cataloged. And I was able to, out of the blue, pull the Village Voice called, called actually see us up, asked if he had a photo of this one uh, woman who got arrested um, and he didn't have any photos. I had an entire archive of her, of her entire evening from the moment that she got uh, pushed on the ground by a police officer to the moment that she was uh, arrested and pulled away. And I was the only person in Occupy Wall Street when I can see other photos and I have video of the evening too, where there's at least 45 people with cell phone cameras and actual DSLRs all surrounding it. And as far as I can tell, because the, the, the girl has written a book or the woman has written a book um, about her about her life and she asked me for photos. So as far as I can tell, I'm the only person who actually has a record of her evening, that kind of really important evening when she, she got went to Rikers for 30 days, like it's a whole story. And I got a full Village Voice spread because of it. And I'm like, that's $600 I got from the Village Voice for it, paid for four hard drives <laughs> that I bought, you know, or whatever. I think I bought a, a new lens, but um, but yeah. yeah I, you know. <laughs> that, that's, that's definitely important, I think, with the workflow. I've actually just started to use Lightroom uh, more so than I have. I used to be just like shoot the photos, make my selects and bridge, uh, open them up in camera raw, make my edits through camera raw, and then export the the selects. Um, but uh, since uh, adopting Lightroom, I've started to actually try to go back and archive my old stuff and put all the metadata in. And yeah, probably by the time I'm 50, I should have my collection done. Um, I, I've been I've been you know various levels of diligence with regard to captioning photos, but it's tough and time consuming, and you know. Then you got video, you got caption video. I, I don't have time for that. You, uh, you but, uh, a yeah. mechanic to caption your video. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm sure I can use Lightroom to caption video too. It's just a matter of actually doing it. Yeah. Be careful. I mean, no, I the interesting process with video in Lightroom is still a little hiccupy with this latest one. We just had a big issue with that on our last workshop. Like oh, it's really? still a little temperamental. Yeah, with the, the latest Creative Cloud update, I'm not sure why. I'm sure there's going to be a patch that comes out for it, but I would be I would be circumspect before you delete those cards. But Photo Mechanic can ingest it, caption it, and put it out the door. But you know, like people, you know, freelancers bag on the, the newspaper guys all the time because they have it so easy or whatever, but they actually just have a really organized workflow. And I don't, 
I mean, it was difficult for, I don't know, when I worked at a newspaper, we would have to be really, really, really focused on, you know, you take your pictures, you, you make your pictures, you process your film, you archive it in the way that it has to be archived. It has to go into a certain system. At the end of the day, you can't just like walk out the door and be like, good luck guys. But like, that's how like a lot of freelancers I feel like act. Mm -hmm. I will say one thing though, when it comes to Photoshop, since that was your original question, um, I would be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't give a shout out to um, Shark Pixel, as in like, you know, Jaws. Shark Pixel because Christy Shark is a brilliant retoucher and her prices are incredibly reasonable. And especially if you want her to do a whole body of work, like say you're shooting a wedding and you don't want to do the post-production on it, or if you're doing journalism stuff, um, she's really great. And she, you give her your ethical guidelines <laughs> and say like, look, I don't want you to take away the wrinkles and remove gray hairs or whatever. Or if you're shooting headshots of corporate people who don't want to see wrinkles and gray hair, she's absolutely brilliant. And she has really great, great work. I mean, she's featured on Kelby and all of that. So I, I sometimes wonder why people spend so much time doing their own post-production on like contest entries and stuff like that when you can hire somebody who's really good for it and build it into your cost production. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I don't have any uh, tips or tricks with regard to Photoshop that I can uh, recommend that you can't get from this video, but the one tip I will say is to learn the shortcuts. I remember when I was first learning Photoshop and I saw one of uh, the other people I worked with who you know had more experience than I did, and what he was able to do with a photograph where he was just basically hitting keys on the keyboard and making all kinds of like crops and, and color corrections and toning and stuff all through the keyboard where, you know, when I was using it, I would have to, you know, point the mouse, go to like edit, go click on this, go click on that. I mean, he was just, he was a master with this. I asked him, how do you, how do you do this? How do you know all that? And he's like, I just practice the shortcuts. I just remember the shortcuts. So I would just say memorize the shortcuts and that'll, that'll definitely help out and speed up your workflow. They, they actually they actually do have uh, I used to have one for premiere they have keyboard like yeah. put the stickers and uh, I never paid attention to it for premiere so or actually I had it for final cut and now I'm on premiere that's I guess why I, I didn't care I'll, I'll make that excuse but they actually have like layouts for your keyboards or stickers that you can put on that give you the keyword combinations the problem is is that you still need to know what that means <laughs> and you need awesome. to know how to use it so I bought those stickers for photo uh, for Premiere, and honestly, if you don't know what you're doing, they still yeah. don't really help. You know, yeah. it, it, you you got you know if you invest the time in memorizing how to do those shortcuts, that's going to speed up everything. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go ahead and close our show out this week with our picks of the week. Uh, Mark, since you're our new new guy this week for the show, uh, what do you have for us? Um, so I've just, you know, been seeing this, uh, everyone's kind of posting these videos by, uh, uh, Corey Rich and Amy Vitale using the new Nikon action, uh, cameras. If, uh, if you haven't seen them, I think they're incredibly, incredibly cool. And I think my favorite things, if you just, you know, Google Corey Rich or, or Amy Vitale, uh, uh, you'll see the, the work they did for, for Nikon in introducing things. It's called, what is it called? The, actually, I wrote it down because I always forget. Key the, Mission uh, 360. The key Mission, yeah, the Key Mission cameras. Yeah, um, great camera. You know, I, I, I just think what those cameras are doing are make me more interested in 360 than anything else I've seen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, with all the VR stuff, I mean, VR is, 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 you know, the VR goggles, that's great for gaming, but I'm not going to put on VR goggles very much to... To, to, to watch and to experience something. So um, these, the way, you know, just look at the, the promo videos and you can see how they're using them in, I think, really interesting ways that work uh, on a website or, or viewing, viewing, you know, view, viewing online. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a, great, a great use of the 360. And, and their, their particular videos are just incredible uses of these cameras. I really admire them. Maybe Nikon will send you one of those since you're, you know, a big yeah. proponent of their gear. There you go. There I am talking about Nikon again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jamie? Well, that's okay because I'm going to talk about Leica. So <laughs> All right. Okay, so I am cuckoo bananas over the new Leica. I, 
I think it's pronounced Sofort, but it is their Instamatic camera that is like their, their new Polaroid that's coming out. Because let's be honest, I mean, I shoot with Leica M's. They're the most brilliant, amazing documentary camera that you can have. And like every once in a while, it's really nice to just have like a little fun camera that you can have fun with. So I'm not that excited about this Snapchat glasses because I just am not a part of the Vine video generation, I guess. But like an Instamatic camera that gives you like a little, I, we're not supposed to call it a Polaroid, so because it's not. Oh. <laughs> like This little Instant thing friends. is just going to be so much fun, especially, you know, when we do so much overseas work, it's so nice to like take a photo and have something to give to someone, you know, make a picture of their family and give it to them. And that might be the only you know, photograph that they have if you're in a refugee camp or something like that. And I just, I think that it's going to be amazing. I can't wait until they start shipping. I, when do they ship? I'm so excited. They ship in November. And so right. <laughs> the second I got the, like, the notice about it, I called the, I called the like Academy director and I was like, Tom, <laughs> I want one of those right now. <laughs> and I want the one in orange, please. <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh the, re the revival of instant photography. All right, Zach, what do you got for us this week? Amusingly enough, you just reminded me that I actually kick-started um, a, a Lomo instant automat camera because I've been wanting to buy one of those for a long time. But I'm like, if I'm going to spend like 80 bucks or whatever it is to get one of the nicer ones, I want to get one that looks cool. Like if, if I'm just buying this to be have fun, I'm going to buy one that's going to be cool. And the, there was a Kickstarter. It's like by far, it's got like $400,000 now or something like that. And they look, they're basically, they're just retro Polaroid cameras. Um, but uh, they have all those things. Um, but uh, my uh, mine is actually going to be. I have two. I have a uh, or one. Uh, the best democracy money can buy. dot com, which is my documentary film I co-produced. Uh, it's now playing in L.A. and uh, soon uh, this coming month it's going to be uh, across the country. Um, and also uh, Mark Abramson, a uh, fantastic photographer, has a show in New York or in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, called uh, Two Face Opening Reception. Uh, I guess sponsored by United Photo Industries. Uh, highly recommend it. Basically, taking overlays, I believe, uh, of uh, basically political photos from the campaign trail with other photos. And uh, he's a really great photographer, great guy. Highly recommend it. It's uh, um, th this Thursday um, at 6 p.m. in Brooklyn. So you can find info on Facebook as well. Cool. Cool. Yeah, we got it. We posted that on our Facebook page, so go check yep. that out, like the Facebook page. Um, and uh, my pick this week is going to be a PSA from uh, Petapixel talking about the updates to the MacBook Pros. So uh, I use the MacBook Pro. I love the the device. I love the computer. So I definitely would recommend if you're a MacBook Pro user or you're interested in MacBook Pros or you're looking to upgrade or whatever. Uh, definitely uh, hold off for at least a, a month or so before the new ones come out. You know, they're talking about this new digital uh, touch sensitive bar that's going to replace all the function keys. So that's interesting. Obviously interesting to see how they implement that. And uh, we were actually talking about this on the photo uh, brigade forum. They were asking about which computer do I get for, you know, what I'm doing and editing. And my personal take was if you're shooting photos, you can get away with the MacBook Air. If you're shooting video, I would say go MacBook Pro. And if you're shooting 4K video or anything higher, I would say go spec'd out MacBook Pro, top of the line, because uh, you don't want that thing to be stuttering on video. And Mac does a great job handling video, from my personal experience. So that's my pick this week. Um, panelists, where can our audience find out more about you? Mark, how about you go first? Well, obviously, I work for a newspaper. It's just gazette.com to look at the work we're doing every day. But uh, I, I try to keep my website somewhat fresh, uh, just at Mark Ri Mark uh, RicePhotography.com. Great, thank you. Jamie? Um, you can find us on MomentaWorkshops.com, which is on the little bar under there. And I'd like to give a special shout out for our one day workshop that is going to be at Photo Week. We do a one day business skills for people who want to break into the nonprofit photography marketplace. So how can you actually go find paying clients that are in the nonprofit sector that are really interested in documentary photography and video? So that's a one day workshop. It's on November 14th. It is a 
$175. And if you're watching this show, call me up for the professional discount code and I will give you an especial around the lens discount code for that. So I hope to see all of you guys there. Wow, our first discount code. Wow. Nice. nice. Um, by the way, uh, wh where is that taking place? That's at the Leica store in DC, in downtown DC. And it's during DC Photo Week, which is a full week of just incredible speakers and workshops and gallery openings and lectures. And it's just an absolutely incredible, incredible time. And it's the week after the elections. So everyone can take a nice breath <laughs> and not have to worry about covering angry crowds and just go talk photo. Um, it's just, it's a phenomenal time. It's just like sun up to sundown photography for a week in Washington, DC. It's a really, really great time. Okay, great. Thank you. Zach? Uh, personal work, uh, zdroberts.com, but uh, obviously you can always find uh, all the Around the Lens info at aroundthelens.com. Yes, indeed. And I'm going to let you know we have a couple things coming up. We got a full slate of uh, panelists lined up for the rest of October. So go to our Facebook page, check out the events page to see who we have coming up on all the next, uh, next big shows. We got a good mix of returning and new panelists coming up. And then November 14th is going to be our big 50th uh, episode, one year anniversary, super spectacular show. So right after the, the election, so we'll get to talk about uh, how that went. Um, our, is our November 7th show? Because the elections are when? November 2nd? The, um, 8th? Eight. Don't ask me. Eight. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, it'll be after the election, so we can, kind of, we can talk about how badly or our Hopefully, how well it went. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, that really, that'll be the special. Really well. <laughs> that'll be, that'll be our first episode of Palooza Chat. <laughs> <laughs> or the the episode where Zach drinks himself into a corner. Either way, because because <laughs> the Green Party candidate wasn't elected. <laughs> oh, and you, have you seen my Facebook page? Do you think I agree with Jill Stein either? No, 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 no. You're just gonna write in somebody, aren't you, Zach? You're gonna write in yourself. I I actually for the first time I actually I vowed when I was when I like was a teenager and I've always said I was gonna run for president eventually. I, I'm 35 this year, so I'm actually eligible to be president for the first time ever. So I actually very well may write myself in because I I can't I can't do it with either of these candidates. So <laughs> yeah. if you're 35, then why did you say very pointedly at the beginning of the show, my generation? Like the three of us are like so far away from you. <laughs> the millennial I'm generation. I can't believe I was I don't know. I don't I forget what the <laughs> reference was. So <laughs> anyways. Uh, Mark, I'm sure you're gonna cover the election, right? Election uh, stuff. I mean you're already covering rallies. So I mean on election day, what do you what do you cover on election absolutely. day? Absolutely. Election nights are always a lot of fun. I Newsrooms just always get kind of electric on election night, so I'll be working election night, I'm sure. What, what do you think? What have you done in the past? Where do you go, like, to a Oh, well, I mean, usually we're, like, yeah, usually we're convention. covering, we're just covering watch parties in the area, okay. you know, and covering the local candidates. Awesome. All right, well, great, great, great show for, you, for everybody tonight. Thank you all, panelists. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Zach. Uh, thank you all for being uh, excellent panelists on episode... 44 of Around the Lens. Uh, I am your host, David Murphy, for Zach Roberts. This has been Around the Lens, episode 44, and we're out.